All right, 15th of February every year, it's International Childhood Cancer Day. It's called ICCD, and it's a global collaborative campaign to raise awareness about childhood cancer and to express support for children and adolescents with cancer, the survivors and their families. And so this morning, we just thought it wise to just bring someone who knows a lot about children, who obviously loves children, to talk about his experience with children who live with cancer and how uh, the journey has been so far. Joining us in the studios this morning is uh, our consultant pediatrician, Dr. Ayodele Rena. Doctor, it's not, I'm meeting you for the first time, but I've heard <laughs> very, I've heard glowing things about yeah. you. Well, Great doctors, about uh, Dr. Rena and Dr. Obu, you know, on this side. What's Dr. Like, Obu? You know, we, 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 you had this. <laughs> I read a lot of great things about you and your love for children. How has that journey led you into meeting children who live with cancers and uh, uh, how has it been? Thank you so much for having me here and happy Valentine's in areas. <laughs> Thank you for greeting us. For those that don't believe in I don't believe in it. Oh, who, who are they? Where are they? Huh? <laughs> really, really fantastic question. The truth is, um, so first of all, my father is a pediatrician. It was his birthday oh, yesterday, so too. many happy returns, daddy. Oh. So um, I was inspired to actually care for children, you know, in whatever capacity I could. And so when I did my residency at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, you are required to rotate through a lot of um, units. And one of the units through which I rotated was the pediatric oncology, which essentially is the cancer unit. And um, I had fantastic teachers. And the experience there taught me that there really is a lot of lack of awareness when it comes to childhood cancer. There, is, there are delays in diagnosis. And unfortunately, despite yeah. our best efforts, you know, unfortunately, we still end up losing a lot of these children, which is quite tragic, considering the fact that most childhood cancers are actually curable. And they achieve cure in the high-income countries. Hmm. Hmm. What, are the, what are the types, types of cancers mainly we're seeing in Nigeria for with children? Uh, so the truth is Nigeria is actually a very variegated sort of um, state when it comes to um, childhood cancers. You find out that down here in Lagos we have more of the blood cancers that we call leukemias. But if you go to places like the east and the north, we have certain cancers that they call lymphomas. Now lymphomas essentially are solid tumors. So for instance, if, with a blood cancer you won't see any specific swelling on any part of the body. The child might just present or complain about weakness that might bleed from places, have a fever for a long time that's just refusing to respond to anything. But with a lymphoma, you'll see an obvious swelling that just rapidly increases in size. Mm -hmm. So between leukemias and lymphomas, those are probably the commonest cancers we have. But other things that we have are eye cancers, kidney cancers, and of course, um, you know, certain other types of blood cancers, you know. So those are probably the most common types of cancers we have here in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. All right, and let's talk about uh, the, the earliest symptoms. You talked about a child falling ill. Maybe that would get, I don't know what stage that one would be. Mm -hmm. What would be the earliest symptoms that could tell that you have to really pay extra attention that the child could be suffering from cancer? Okay, um, so the symptoms of cancer can be very varied, you know, depending on what type of cancer is available or is, pre or is the child is suffering from. So, um, for instance, I would say that for the commonest types of cancer, so for instance, that lymphoma I was referring to, mm. if there is any part of the body of a child that is swelling, I would say that is a red flag. A swelling that is refusing to go down because there are some swellings that are just simple things like boils. Mm -hmm. So what some you know parents or some caregivers would do is that if there is a swelling, the next thing they pounce on is rub and a hot massage and a hot towel to be pressing it. And you've done that for a week, it's not going. You've done that for two weeks and it's not going. That is a red flag for you to say, you know what, I need to go to the hospital and present and ask someone who knows or who might know what exactly this is. The other thing, of course, is a fever. A fever that has lasted for more than a week, despite treatments. Because what happens usually is that we will start antimalarials and sometimes be so bold as to go and start antibiotics or even herbal concoctions. Mm -hmm. And after one self week... Self-medicating. Self-medicating, yes, yeah. self-medicating. And after one week, the fever still hasn't gone. You know, two weeks, the fever still hasn't gone. That is another red flag to say that consider. Even though, fortunately, it, you know, the commonest causes of fevers that last that long usually are cancers, but it needs to be diagnosed because 
one child lost to cancer is 100% for that particular family. It might just look like statistics, so it's not just one child out of the 50 million or the 100 million in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But no, that's for that family, if they have issues, you know, having other children, then mm -hmm. that's 100% loss for that particular family. Right. You know, Dr. Rena, back in the days, uh, cancer is such sort a of taboo subject and everyone used to, but I, 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 I picked on, two, on one, two things you talked about, the awareness, which is what we're doing here, and then yeah. the other one, which is the fact that it can be prevented, or it can be is it prevented, and you said uh, treated. Is yes, it? exactly, so cure. cure. So, so for childhood cancers, unfortunately, the truth is that um, a lot of screening programs don't really exist for childhood cancers. Unlike adults that have things like prostate cancer, mm. things like cervical cancer, breast cancer, where you can do cell breast examination, a prostate examination, or even a pap smear. Unfortunately, with childhood cancers, um, it's very difficult to actually do any sort of screening test to detect it before it begins to happen. Mm. So meaning that early identification, early presentation to the hospital should you suspect is very key in the treatment of childhood cancers because a lot of them are curable with the right diagnostic tools with access to the right therapy and um, treatment options and follow-up then you really can achieve cure but of course there really are barriers in this environment as there are to a lot of other things here in this part I'll, of the I'll world. I'll come to the barriers in, in a bit but are there some you know man-made causes that bring about are children coming down with cancers? Uh, what are those causes? Mm. The causes. Sorry, just to remind us, by the way, in the 12 minutes that we've been talking, four children have died of cancer. Just to put that wow. out there, four children have died wow. of cancer. So, um, predisposing factors, unfortunately, till now, nobody actually knows what causes cancer. Mm. You can suspect or say these might be the things, but nobody has been able to, you know, say for certain that these are the things that actually cause cancer. So some of the things that we have identified that are associated with cancer include things like exposure to certain chemicals. Mm. So chemicals like um, well, the benzene. Now, benzene is a sort of hydrocarbon that is very common in things like solvents, chemical solvents, things that they use to dissolve things like paint. So one must as much as possible avoid exposing children to those sorts of things. Ionizing radiation. Now, ionizing radiation is a sort of radiation that we find in things like CT scans, x-rays, and oh. things like that, exactly. So exposure or excessive exposure to those things actually can cause cancer. And the truth of the matter is that, of course, sometimes if you have to do the x-ray, you have to do the x-ray. Mm -hmm. You just have to expose the child, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that it really is a combination of genetic and environmental exposures. Mm -hmm. There are some children who will do x-rays and nothing happens to them, mm -hmm. while others, all they need is just one exposure to the x-ray. So, you know, and that which is where diagnostics is going, uh, diagnostics, uh, diagnostics are going to. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find out what genes are responsible for these cancers coming about because if people have those genes, then we know that, oh, they really should avoid doing, you know, certain Some things to things, prevent. Yeah. Mm. Lifestyle changes. So right now, you know, things like consumption of excessive, excessive consumption of refined foods, exposure to hydrocarbons from things like generator fumes, mm -hmm. the cars on the road. Mm. And then sometimes people have even really reported that living under high tension wires, you know, mm. which, which, which is a housing problem because you find out that yeah. you, th you might just imagine that, oh, um, housing has nothing to do with cancer. But if housing is inadequate and people are just building shanties absolutely anyway under high tension wires, if truly that is a predisposing factor to cancer, then we are risking the lives of these children who have potential to do great things, yeah. you know, for this nation. And then exposure to pesticides in our food, you know. So mm -hmm. if you excessive use of, use of chemicals like pesticides and you think, oh, you know, what, what has food got to do with cancer? But for the child who has a genetic predisposition to develop cancer, if they eat these pesticides on these foods, then they can develop certain types of cancers. Mm. Wow. Mm. Well, uh, yeah. I, I have this question and uh, what's been the most, I don't want to, Put it this way, perhaps uh, emotional, I don't want to say pathetic, emotional case that you treated of a child mm -hmm. who you eventually lost and what was the joy that you had when on a particular occasion you treated one and the, the child survived? We, so there was a child, I mean, I, had, I was just fresh in the unit, and you know how these things happen. People who actually suffer loss at war, either the people who are just coming into the war front and they don't know what they are doing. Yeah. Or the people that have been in the war front for so long, they become overconfident. I was the former. I came, didn't know what I was doing, very happy, strolling into the ward. And I saw this child and she said to me that, oh, tomorrow is my birthday. Mm. And I said, oh, okay, that's nice. All right, fine, no problem. So we gave her her chemotherapy. I said, okay, fine, no problem. Tomorrow I'll bring you something. And of course, the following day, I came to the ward with a present, biscuits and stuff, but she was dead. 
Oh. As a matter of fact, when I entered the ward, they were trying to resuscitate her. She had a um, leukemia, which is essentially a blood you know, cancer, mm -hmm. but it had spread to her brain and it had compressed certain vital parts of her brain, and of course, she died. So, it, so that was a rude awakening for me to say that a child that might be here with you today might not be there tomorrow simply because these cancers can be very aggressive. Mm -hmm. But we did have some very good results with I'm some children. I'm not looking to, I want to take care of this because I'm <laughs> we already... We did have some very good results with okay. children who had um, kidney tumors. That kidney tumor is called Wilms tumor. And so once um, chemotherapy can be administered and mm -hmm. the, the bad of the kidney with the cancer is um, excised mm -hmm. and radiotherapy is administered, a lot of those children survive, as well as the ones with the cancer of the eye, which is called a retinoblastoma. Mm -hmm. So like, we really did have very good results. And some of them right now are university. And these are people that I saw, you know, as um, oh, children. Oh, that's cherry. Yes, very good news. So it's not all bad news, even though things really can be better. Yeah. You know, Dr. Rena, we you talk about barriers, you know, that you face also too. I'm, I'm thinking that when you think about things, for example, like healthcare cover in the country, which is in a shambolic state right now, I mean, maybe one yeah. in ten Nigerians have access to healthcare cover through insurance. But even then, it doesn't even cover the cost and the medication, the the treatment for yes. cancer. You know, and I I think this is well, does is there any difference now? Or it's still what mm -hmm. it is. Um, thanks, Agogo. Um, really, it, it's, um, it really hasn't changed very much um, in the last few years. Um, so mm -hmm. health cover by insurance really is still, um, as you said, shambolic for lack <laughs> if I may borrow your term. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. Two is that once you, the healthcare worker does have the right frame of mind or the training to identify cancer, making the diagnosis is very important. And sometimes, the making a very specific diagnosis requires some molecular tests that require that these samples be sent to places as far as South Africa. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the results might not be available for weeks on end. And that is weeks lost to the cancer, essentially, because every day that cancer is not treated, it gives the opportunity to spread to other places. And so that really is abysmal. And of course, a lot of these parents pay for these things out of pocket. So no one, uh, you know, is coming to their aid in terms of um, insurance, even though, you know, foundations like the Dockers Foundation that, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm representing, you know, speaking on behalf of here, mm -hmm. you know, comes into play in terms of giving them some sort of assistance financially, but there's only so much that they can do. Yeah. And so before they're able to even raise funds to run the test to diagnose, you have to think about how much they will need to spend for a two-year, three-year course that is required to cure this cancer. And this is not two-year, three years of uh, taking vitamin C. No, it's taking drugs that are potentially toxic that will require, you know, follow-up, cons consistent yeah. follow-up. Doctor, mm -hmm. we have to go now, but uh, just what you said now will confirm the fact that people have talked about, um, uh, let me say, a dirge in first equipment to treat uh, cancer diagnosis and then personnel we have that we have limited oncologists in the country we have so many things limited how is the country dealing with this we have to do this in just a minute if you can so, yes i can so that is absolutely correct and i would like to just mention that the Dorcas foundation is actually um, starting off the pediatric cancer access program mm -hmm. in which and it's launching um in two days time and um, you can find them on social media the Dorcas foundation mm -hmm. part of the initiative is to advocate and advocate to lawmakers to say that cancer exists amongst us and it can happen to absolutely anyone's child and the solution really is not running to India or running to South Africa or to the US because at the end of the day it's going to be a cost on that family so training of medical personnel to recognize diagnose and treat cancer is very important educating the public on the signs and symptoms of cancer and making sure that they present early and access treatment is very key and I think once we are and bolstering the health insurance to cater to yeah children that have cancer because our children with cancer are being neglected and by the way about 16 children have died of cancer in the time well, i that don't like that about. report mm. Mm. i don't it's like true. that report yeah. but it, i mean the reality it's, face. Face. it's the yeah. reality yeah. thank you very much uh, dr Adeli Rena. Thank, thank you dr Obo. <laughs> <laughs> you see now, uh, from the renowned uh, consultant pediatrician oncologist thank you very much i, I told you if i would get thanks for all the good here. things that thank you, you do really appreciate thank you very thank much. you very much and a uh, happy birthday again to dr Rena senior thank you so much thank you very much i, I wonder how <laughs> the family meetings are like when they have the, the, the <laughs> No, no pediatrics. No, he's the doctor of camera and microphone. That's what you doctor. <laughs> okay, that's news hub today. I want to thank all of our guests who've been on the show, those who've called in, and those uh, our resource persons all over, if you may believe, and other distinguished gentlemen 
who would be on the show today. News Hub will return tomorrow. Hope you join us then. Have a beautiful week. I am Shun Weediji. And I am Aurora Obo. Temples for GTs. Abiento. I knew you were going to bring something new. I just, <laughs> something new. So we're going to say something new. Something. It's time passes away very quickly. <laughs> really? <laughs> Thanks for watching.